Well, good morning and welcome to our service here at New Life Church in Toulon. We're, uh, we are delighted that you're with us today and we're looking forward to a great time of worshiping and praising the Lord together. Those of you that are here in person and of course those of you who are watching online, we are grateful for that. As we begin our service this morning, we want to invoke the presence of God and His Holy Spirit. Uh, this morning, would you join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together on this, on this beautiful Sunday morning. We thank you that we have been enabled to uh, get out of our beds, uh, get into our cars, and to come here. And those who are online watching, that they're able to be at their computer. We pray that through this service, that our hearts' needs would be fully met through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is the answer for every problem in our lives. And that there's nothing we go through that he cannot help us through and guide us through and give us strength for. It. And I pray that this may happen today for each and every one of us. And so we just ask your blessing upon this service. Be with us and may our worship be pleasing to you in all things. For we ask this in the wonderful and the precious name of our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right. We're going to praise the Lord this morning. The music team is going to Amen. lead us in a time of praise and worship. So. Amen. We're going to do that now. All right, good morning. Let's morning. stand together. Morning. He's an awesome God, and He is so good. He's awesome. Yeah, he's awesome.
so good.
Oh, thank you, music team, for leading us in that time of praise and worship. Uh, it's good to be able this, to exalt the Lord uh, through our singing. This morning, our scripture reading is from the book of Romans, uh, chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. And so this morning, our scripture reading will be read for us by Sandra Salmon. Uh, follow along as she reads it for us, please. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many form one body, and with each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prosperity, then pro prophecy, prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give uh, generosity. Generously. If it is to be, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Amen. Thank you, Sandra, for leading us in our scripture reading this morning. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask my wife, uh, Linda, to join me. We have a few announcements to share with you this morning. We've been announcing this over the past several uh, weeks now that uh, um, our congregational ministry team has been looking at the idea of a pancake breakfast as a fundraiser both for the ongoing war in Ukraine and the needs there as well as for the uh, Toulon Food Bank. We've had several folks who have indicated an interest in helping out with that and if you are interested in helping out, Lyle uh, Sutton is the man here to talk to and we're planning this for probably what, the fall? Uh, is that what you're thinking Lyle? I'm thinking early October. Early October. So uh, uh, please be in prayer for us as we seek to um, this uh, outreach venture. Our regular Tuesday afternoon prayer time and Bible study is going to be canceled for this week. Oh. And Thursday night our Bible study is completed for the summer. We've had a great uh, time looking at the bait of Satan and that has now finished and we're done for the summer. Kids Club will meet at 6.30 uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, because of that, we ask you at the end of the service to move your chairs to the side so they can have lots of room to run around. And then uh, the next week following is the big wind-up, so be in prayer for that. It's an incredible outreach. Mm -hmm. Also, our moose will meet on Friday evening. Is there anything, we, Emily, we should add to that? Uh, The week after that, uh, the first Friday in June, we are planning to have a bigger or better game in town. Each team will be starting off with a paper clip. And they go around the house to us, asking to trade in for something that is either bigger or better than said paper clip. <coughs> Remember the uh, bigger and better that they ran at the Stonewall Youth Group a number of years ago when they came to our house. And I remember we got left with a kid's size mattress for a crib. <laughs> <laughs> but we did get rid of an old table. <laughs> well, it was bigger. Yeah, it was bigger. Uh, not better. <laughs> uh, I guess this is mine, eh? Yep. Uh, extreme day camp. Uh, I don't know if that's a typo there, or is that intended that way, uh, Emily and Crystal? What do you mean? It's extreme. extreme. What did I say? What it is. I know, but I'm saying there's no E. No. Because, because it's so extreme. It's not NLE, it's NLX. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so extreme, it doesn't need the extra E. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was a typo. You missed the letter E. Okay. So that's up and coming. Um, 
approximately, that's going to be running July 18th to the 22nd. So, uh, on the hopefully, uh, if you're able to help out, uh, I think Linda made a good suggestion last week. What did you say? I said if you're a grandparent, then you, we, we need to be here to support those kids. I know that some of you are working and not able to be here, but if you are a grandparent and retired and at home, then you commit to one day. <laughs> Men's get Donut Fellowship. This Friday, and I believe this is the last one. Is this the last one for the for? Oh, it isn't. Forget we'll that. We'll decide this Friday what we're going to do after that. Okay. So but I will be phoning the guys about six o'clock in the morning so they don't forget. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you better let Steve know you're coming. Otherwise, you get a six o'clock phone call. This Friday at ten o'clock at the church. And that's for uh, Ron Finley and Ron Meads. They both slept in last. Uh, Last time. So, uh, yesterday and uh, Friday evening, we had the uh, Baptist General Conference of Canada meetings uh, in, Winnip in Winnipeg, in Stonewall, at New Life Church, the church where Linda and I were uh, for 45 years, and this was the uh, group of folks that gathered together. I think we had about, what, 60 delegates, something like that. 65 delegates that came, and uh, these were the uh, delegates, uh, myself, plus these three beautiful ladies, uh, here, uh, Debbie Chartrand, Emily Green, and Linda, and uh, here they are belting out the uh, singing there during that service. So we had a wonderful uh, time uh, there. And I would like to announce that Emily Green was voted in at that meeting, and she is a member of the Central Advisory Board for the Baptist General Conference of Canada. Canada. <laughs> Emily will be serving uh, in, in this district, Central Canada, which covers Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario. And um, she will be working with Chopper Wilson, and some of you remember when he was here. Also, uh, we are feeling, the women in the church are feeling a little left out because the men have so much fun with their donut fellowship. Amen. <laughs> but I'm happy to announce there's something really exciting coming. <laughs> That's all I'm saying right now because we've got some details to work out. But there is something super exciting coming for women. Because you came up with the idea this morning driving to church. No. <laughs> uh, Sharon, Jordan, and I have been putting our heads together, and uh, there, there's some fun things coming up for women. So stay tuned. Be here next week. We'll let you know. Will donuts be involved? No donuts. No. Well, I'm not going. All right. We have the kids' story The Walls of Jericho. So, kids, listen up. The Faithful Hall of Fame, Joshua. This is Joshua. Oh, hey. Joshua was the leader of the Israelites, who God used to bring his people to the Promised Land. Yeah, let's do it. When God told Joshua it was time to take the Promised Land, Joshua sent spies into the city of Jericho. While those spies were in Jericho, Come on! they were protected by a woman named Rahab. The spies promised to spare Rahab and her family when they took back the land. Yay! And she hung a scarlet cord from her window to remind them of their promise. See you soon! Now the Israelites had crossed the Jordan and were camped near the town of Jericho. Hey, One day, Joshua looked up, uh -huh. and there was a man standing before him. Hello. The man said, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Joshua asked what the man wanted to tell him, and the Lord said he wanted Joshua to take the city of Jericho. All right. But that Joshua needed to follow his instructions exactly. You got it. Jericho was shut for fear of the Israelites. Yeah, well, huh? yeah, well. No one came out and no one came in. So the Lord told Joshua to gather his soldiers. And march around the city for six days. Man. The priests were to take the Ark of the Covenant and seven priests were to go in front of it. 
blowing a ram's horn. On the seventh day, they were to march around the city seven times and blow the horn. Then all the people of Israel were to give a great shout. Gremlin. And then the city walls would fall. Gremlin. Yeah, let's do it. So Joshua said, Shout for the Lord has given you the city. And the people did shout. Yeah! And the walls did fall. Let's go! The Israelites overtook the city of Jericho as God had commanded. Rahab. They remembered Rahab because of her faithfulness. Joshua was faithful in carrying out God's commands, and the Israelites took many other cities as God told them they would. Oh, nice. For God will never fail to fulfill His promises. So the Israelites came to live in the land that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, Israel, Joseph, and Moses many years ago. Well, there you go, the story of the capture of the city of Jericho, the walls of Jericho. Um, will there be children's church today? Um, no, not today. All right, we have a special number this morning. Lori Ben is coming to minister to us in music. And uh, thank you, Lori, for using your spiritual gift to minister to us this morning. God bless you.
the sentiment in your heart and life this morning as well that you are his. Probably one of the most exciting things in life is opening up a present that someone has given you, somebody that loves you. And here's a present that Linda was opening from me uh, Christmas, uh, several Christmases ago. And she was just so excited to receive this outstanding gift uh, from me. Um, <clears throat> perhaps you will, uh, hear, you've heard the story about the, uh, uh, there was a teacher's day at the, the kindergarten class and the kindergarten teacher was receiving gifts from all her pupils. And the kids would bring their gifts uh, to her and the florist's son came and brought a gift and the teacher took it. She looked at it and she shook it over her head and she said, uh, is it flowers? And the uh, florist's son said, yes. How'd you know? Oh, she said, just a wild guess. And um, then the next one was a girl whose father owned a caddy shop. And she took the gift and she shook it over her head and uh, she said, is it chocolates? And the little girl said, yes. How'd you know? Oh, she said, just a lucky guess. And then the third one was the son of a liquor store owner, uh, owner. and uh, he came with a bag, and it was dripping, and uh, she took the bag, and she held it over her head, and she asked the boy, is it wine? And the boy said, no, and she said, is it champagne? And uh, he said, no, and she took a, uh, uh, one of the uh, drops, put it to her tongue, and then she asked, she said, is it whiskey? whiskey? And the little boy said, no. Well, she was quite perplexed. And finally she said to the little boy, I give up, what is it? And the little boy said, it's a puppy. Well, the Bible talks about the fact that our God is a gift-giving God. And probably the most important and significant gift that he gives to us, of course, is our salvation through eternal life in Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, on the uh, day of Pentecost, Peter preaching to the people there in Jerusalem said to the people, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, our, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And notice then he says, And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. So that's, of course, obviously the most significant gift that you can receive. And if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, if you're watching online and you've never taken that step of opening the door of your heart and asking Christ to come in, do it today. That's the most important gift you can receive. Well, there are a multitude of other gifts that God gives to us, our lives themselves, uh, the health we enjoy, <coughs> the food we eat, and on and on and on. The air we breathe, uh, just uh, so many things. The psalmist says that when you open your hand, they, that's talking about all of us as people, are satisfied with good things. And we receive a multitude of, of different things. James 1, 6, uh, 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. For example, talking about gifts and some very uh, uh, significant gifts that we really don't really acknowledge that all too often. Here's a question. What do you do 25,920 times a day and rarely notice? What do you do, what will you do 540 times during the duration of this message without realizing it. I think I heard somebody give the right answer. You will breathe. Did you know that by the time you were 40 years of age, you will have already taken 378 million breaths? And when you're Steve Morales' age, that's about, uh, about a billion breaths uh, by that time. Uh, you get his age. Uh, Job chapter 12, verse 10 says, In his hands there is the life of every creature, and the breath of all mankind. And as long as uh, we live, we take those breaths. They, you know, there's one of the worst things uh, is not being able to get your breath. You ever get your wind knocked out? And, and you know the panic uh, that happens? Uh, people who suffered severe forms of COVID, uh, one of the things, especially the uh, earlier variants, affected the lungs in a great way. 
And uh, the panic that came. Remember when my father was uh, in the hospital and he was um, diagnosed with, uh, well, just really old age probably, but he, uh, he, he couldn't get his breath in the last uh, few couple of days. And, and he was uh, scratching and trying to pull his, uh, his uh, bed clothing off to get breath. And he actually would go and open the window. You know, a terrible, terrible thing to not be able to do. Well, you take that for granted. It's a gift from God. Well, there's a category of gifts the Bible calls spiritual gifts. And uh, there are some of you who have already unwrapped your spiritual gift. And you found it transformed your life. Let me give uh, acknowledgement to some of the wonderful people here that uh, in our church. And one of these is the uh, beautiful lady, Debbie Chartrand. I, uh, this cartoon really doesn't really uh, fit uh, the image. I, I used this cartoon in our newcomers class when we talked. I thought that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and she's not in the tax secretary, but she does a great job. And, and, and I watch as she uses her spiritual gifts. And it's such a blessing to the whole church. She puts together our church newsletter, and I know you received it in the email earlier uh, this weekend, and she just does a super job using her spiritual gift. But there are some of you, possibly, who are here this morning, if I were to ask you what is your spiritual gift, you wouldn't have the foggiest idea what your spiritual gift is. Um, and so this morning, I want to look at this topic of spiritual gifts. And our passage that we're going as we're working our way through the book of 1 Peter is now verses 10 and 11 of chapter 4. And in the New International Version, it goes like this. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And so this morning I'm entitled my message, Unwrapping Your Gift. And of course we're talking about spiritual gifts. And before we look at that, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather together in this way. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who distributes the spiritual gifts in his own knowledge and purpose and wisdom. And gives us exactly the spiritual gift that we are to have, that we need. And Lord, this morning as we gather together and we look at this topic, uh, open the eyes of those who are your children, who truly know you, here this morning, to see what their spiritual gift is. And may they be uh, um, find their lives filled with using it for your praise and glory and honor. And so we just commit this service to you. I stand against all the forces of darkness. I command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. Holy Spirit, I welcome you here as well to guide and lead us into the truth. And we will give you all the praise and the glory. For we pray this in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Amen. I just come home from my first year at uh, Bible College when I got a phone call one uh, day from a person in charge of Sunday school in my home church picture of my home church back in Saskatchewan, the highest Baptist church. This is the church I went to uh, through my growing up years. And the person asked me, Henry, would you be willing to teach the high school Sunday school class? And I'm not sure what prompted it, but I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And I'll never forget uh, that experience uh, going in. It's a, black, a group of about eight or ten teenagers, um, and I began teaching them God's Word the following Sunday morning. And uh, the uh, experience I went with, their, their response to these kids was absolutely overwhelming. And it was so exciting to watch the teenagers just get hungry to, uh, and excited about the Bible and its teaching. And, and uh, the, uh, we, the, through the weeks, the numbers of the kids grew, started coming to our, uh, our uh, Sunday school class. And it was a wonderful, positive uh, experience for me. Uh, watching the enthusiasm of these kids. And um, I, I remember thinking as I uh, was teaching those kids, I think I might have the gift of teaching. Well, one of the teachings of the Bible is that every believer in Christ receives at least one spiritual gift from God. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, our text, uh, Peter writes, each one 
should use whatever gift he has received. Now, I said before, and I said again, there are probably some of you here, I'm sure if I were to go through the aisle by aisle and ask you, and those of you watching online, if I were to ask you, what is your spiritual gift? As I said before, you wouldn't have the foggiest uh, uh, idea. Now, the fact that if you, that you may not know what your spiritual gift is doesn't mean you don't have one. You, you can have a spiritual gift and not know what it is, and that's possible. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. So if you don't know about your spiritual gift, you are ignorant, and God doesn't want you to be ignorant. He wants you to know. He wants you to be aware of what your spiritual gift is. And unfortunately, a lot of people are ignorant and a lot of misunderstanding out there. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Romans 12, 6, the passage that uh, Sandra read for us earlier on out of that text. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. And so when you accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, uh, God gave you at least one spiritual gift, possibly even more in some cases. And these gifts then enable us to do God's work for him. As Peter says in our text, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And so you may have the gift of administration. This is the gift my wife has, and she can organize some things like you would believe. You should see uh, the dresser in uh, her dresser, and you should see my dresser at our house. And you can tell she's got the gift of administration or organization, <laughs> which I just do not. Uh, and everyone has a different gift, and these a different gift, and these gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians twelve four. Now there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but there is the same Holy Spirit who is the source of them all, and it's the Holy Spirit then who decides who gets what gift. He is the one who makes the determination. All right, well, we'll have the gift of teaching, and I'm sure that that's exactly your gift. Well. You've got it. And, and you use it for God's glory. And uh, this church benefits because of your faithfulness in using that gift. And so it is uh, uh, with uh, others. Some of you have the gift of evangelism. You have been able to win others to Christ. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. And when you, we talk to you, we walk away feeling built up and lifted up and encouraged. Some of you have the gift of wisdom. We're going through tough times and... We wonder, what should we do? And you come alongside of us and you tell us, wow, what, what about this, what about that? And wow, it clicks. Yeah, that's the answer. You've got the gift of wisdom. You can have the gift of knowledge, on or not. And it says, it is the one and only, it is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. He decides, he alone decides which gift each person should have. First Corinthians 12, 11. Now, here's another point. I don't know when we're talking about spiritual gifts. That no one receives all the gifts. Nobody has all of the gifts. And no one single gift is given to everyone. The Holy Spirit distributes these gifts according to His wisdom. We're told. Now, through the years, I've had many people who say to me, and when you get to talk about the uh, topic of spiritual gifts, immediately the conversation by some people is directed to the gift of tongues. And some will say to me, Oh, Pastor Henry, everyone has to speak in tongues. I've had people tell me that. I should, I, I should be doing that. And my response is to tell people, no, well, I'm sorry to say, but the Bible teaches otherwise. Tongues is one of the gifts. The Greek word glosso literally means speaking foreign languages without being able to learn uh, them. And it says in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 30, all do not have the gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? And notice there, the use of what it's in Greek is called the ume construction, which literally is translated correctly in this translation, all do not, suggesting it's asking the negative and expecting a negative response. So when it says, all do not have gifts of healings, the answer is no. All do not speak with tongues, well, no. Uh, all do not interpret, well, no. That's the answer it's, and it's expecting. So there are some, but not all. And everyone has their unique spiritual gift. And they use it in the way God enables them. Now, there are people who think, I have nothing to offer in service to God. And that's simply not true. Because as I said, each of us have been given at least one spiritual gift 
that to will make you eternally useful in the kingdom of God. Eternally useful in the kingdom of God. Ephesians 4, 7, he's given to each one of us a special gift according to the generosity of Christ. Apparently someone has done the uh, study on this and has come up with the calculation that if you take a common bar of iron um, and uh, you uh, uh, cut it uh, uh, up into about, I think it's about a pound. I talked to one of the guys in uh, Stonewall. I think he said it was, uh, Al Summer said, I think he said it was $7 a pound. I can it. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Anyways, um, they said if you take that bar of iron, whatever amount that is, costing $7, but if you turn and use that same metal to build a shovel, it's worth about $25. If you use that same pound of metal and use it to make needles, those needles, the amount of needles you get out of that would cost $3,285. But if you take that same bar of iron and use it to make the springs in a fancy watch, it's worth a quarter of a million dollars. Now, let me say this. That last one, that's you. God has put a spiritual gift in you that makes you worth an incredible amount to the kingdom of God. And so every believer has a spiritual gift to use in ministering to Christ's body. Again, back to our text. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. Now, studies, and, and there's uh, scholars will kind of differ on this, and I've read different, many different books on this topic, and, uh, and theologians will vary as to the number of spiritual gifts that are listed. Uh, most commonly, it's agreed that there's about 20 spiritual gifts list, listed in the Bible. Some question um, the uh, things like uh, uh, crafts uh, as being a gift, and they base it on the Old Testament uh, work of uh, Oholiab and Bezalel when they built the Ark of the Covenant and all the other furniture in the temple, and said they had been gifted, and that was the ability to use their hands to make things uh, construct things, and some suggest that's a spiritual gift. It's only mentioned in the Old Testament, and there's debate on that. The gift of the gap, I don't think is a spiritual gift to go to this cartoon, but it may be. Um, the ability to speak God's words is for him. Now, because each of these gifts, uh, each one of us has a part to play that no one else on earth is able to do. Um, as I said, uh, uh, in my life, earlier on, I discovered that one of my gifts was the gift of teaching. And I'll, I'll never forget when uh, Linda and I, we started in the church in Stonewall. Here, this was back in the winter of 1970. And I remember one of the ladies, as she was leaving the service that morning, she was just so thankful for the service and everything else. And, and I, you know, I, of course, I was 21 years of age, and I said, you know, uh, you know thank you for saying that. And why do you say that? And she said to me, the way you explain the Bible, I can understand it. And she was a, an elderly lady, gone to church for many years, and she said, all of a sudden, it's, it's like it's opening up the Bible to me. And, 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 and it was a really a gratifying thing to realize that I was able to do this for the glory of God. It was me, it was God working in and through me, his spiritual gift working through me. It's, it, has, it doesn't make you any better when you have a spiritual gift. It, it makes you a tool that God uses. And uh, so that... Uh, spiritual gift that is a divine enabling for you to use in serving God. It's kind of like the gasoline tank that I've got in the cartoon there. And uh, the empowerment to do the work comes from God. And uh, I have the guy here. This is... I should have drawn you Lyle, on there. I gave that guy too much hair. Um, but let's say that's the Tuesday afternoon Bible study in this cartoon. The guy teaching. I'm sorry. The guy teaching in this cartoon, that's supposed to be you, but I gave, I gave you too much hair. This was you 40 years ago. Were you black 40 years ago? Yeah. It was. All right. So this is an old cartoon of you. Um, anyways, the spiritual gift of teaching is the, the enablement. It's the empowering 
It's the gasoline that you put into the lawnmower that makes it cut the grass. That's what the spiritual gift is. And these gifts are given not for personal gratification. They are given for the benefit of others. Now, when you use your gift, there's gratification in it for sure. Um, uh, when I use my spiritual gift, a uh, gift of evangelism, I just, it just really uh, motivates me in a, in a great way, and I, I enjoy it. But it's not for my benefit. It's for the benefit of those recipients of that work accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit in and through the spiritual gift. And so that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. And your spiritual gift, God intends to, you to use it to help all of the rest of the people in the body of Christ. The gifts of pastors and teachers uh, are given to help the church. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, he is the one who gave the gifts to the church. The, and these are five specific gifts that the, the Holy Spirit has given to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of the Son of God that we will be mature and fully grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. And so as I use my spiritual gift and teach you, you hopefully will become spiritually mature and grow as a result. And that's the way God intends the church to operate. And I, I'm going to use my spiritual gift as a pastor to help you uh, in your spiritual growth. Now, in, in our text, uh, the spiritual gifts are divided into two broad categories. There are those which we call the speaking gifts, using the ability of speaking that God has given to us for his purposes. And the list of gifts includes things like preaching, evangelism, missions, apostle, teaching, encouragement, uh, wisdom, discernment, knowledge, music, etc. And so as you use your vocal cords, that's the speaking part of your gifts. Then there are what we call the serving gift, and that's using our ability to serve God, for uh, serve others for God's purposes. And these include things like uh, service, showing mercy, uh, hospitality, giving, faith, arts and crafts, intercession, healing, miracles, leadership, administration. Um, I think it's the word service here can be translated as the gift of helps as well. And so um, what these are is enabling to do works. So you have speaking gifts and serving gifts. And uh, when it comes to these serving gifts, it takes energy to do this, uh, and it's the energy, the empowerment through the Holy Spirit that God provides us through these gifts to give you the necessary energy to get everything done that God wants done. First Corinthians, or Philippians 4.13, as Paul said, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. I, I, I want to acknowledge some of you in our church here, the amazing work that you do. And I want to draw attention to two of the wonderful young ladies, both leading us in our praise and worship this morning. Emily with her amazing work she does with the youth group, and uh, uh, Crystal with her work with the kids club. And as, we, as I watch them, I see them, they're using their spiritual gifts. And as a church family, I want to say thank you to you two ladies for all you do. As a matter of fact, I think you've appropriate. We all gave them like, an ovation. <laughs> thank you, ladies, for what you do. And by singling them out, I am not saying that what you do is important. You do what you do. Thank you as well. We appreciate it. It's through all of us that this church becomes what it, God wants it to be. Now, that means you are to use your spiritual gift. God wants us to discover our spiritual gift and begin to use it. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And so what God does is he gives you the gift, but it's up to you to fan it into flame. In other words, it may lie dormant inside of you all of your Christian life never getting used. And what a tragedy would that be. Mm. Now there's some very good spiritual gift tests that you can take, and through the years I've come across a number of them. You Google spiritual gift tests and go online, you can get all sorts. And if you're of uh, these tests, if you are interested in doing a spiritual gift test, talk to me. I can get that information to you. I suggest that you begin the process of praying. 
Pray for insight from God. Ask him to reveal to you what your spiritual gift is. Just ask him. Say, Lord, Pastor, I need to talk about spiritual gifts today. I have no idea what my spiritual gift is. Would you please show me? And if you begin it by praying what your spiritual gift is. Then I suggest start trying out various ministries. And it's oftentimes through trial and error, and sooner or later you begin to discover, hey, I'm really good at this. There's other things you're not good at. I remember when Linda was working in the church in Stonewall, the earlier on as we first started, she got involved with kids' ministries. And she enjoyed kids' ministries, did a good job, but she just never really, it, it, I could tell it wasn't her thing. And then she got involved in women's ministries. Not only did she end up serving in the church, she took that as a, her career and became the Baptist General Conference of Canada Director of Women's Ministries, uh, serving full-time for how many years? 14. 14 years. Uh, and she traveled all across the country working with various women's groups in different churches all across uh, the nation. And she found her niche. And God just exploded his ministry through her. Uh, another thing is ask other believers what they see in you. People who know you, another believer, and ask them, what do you think? What, what do you see in me? What gift do you think I may have? And uh, especially spiritually minded, people who have spiritual discernment, go to them and say, what do you think about me? What's my spiritual gift? Ask them that. Here's a point that I want to make a practical point, but actually you and I were talking about this this week, and, and we, we, we thought this is a good idea. It needs to be uh, directed uh, uh, to, to all of us. And that is those of us who are mature believers need to take the initiative in pointing out potential ministry gifts that we see in other young believers. And there's a background to this. Our, our oldest grandson, who is 19, went to uh, Youth Quake, uh, the youth retreat at Karenport, at Barker's Bible College, a couple of weekends ago. And as they were traveling back, I sent him a text, and I said, uh, in the text I asked him, I said, Evan, how did your weekend go? And he came back and said, oh, it was awesome, Grandpa. Just tremendous. And he went on to say, say how he had so benefited by the weekend and he said, as a matter of fact, now his plans are this coming September to go with the ministry of YWAT and Youth with a Mission. And uh, it's going to be very difficult for him because they're going uh, to Hawaii to uh, learn in Hawaii how to be missionaries. And uh, it's going to be a real struggle. We're going to have to go there next Christmas and, and help him out. Uh, that'll be a struggle for you too, right? Uh, but, but Steve Moraz says it's tough. And, uh, it's tough. It's tough. And uh, so, uh, and he said in his text, uh, but uh, he said after YWAM, he said, you know, I think I might get some schooling here at Briarcrest Bible College. And he said, I might go, I might become, and his was the phrase he used. A pastor of sort. Pastor of sorts, right? That's what he put. Pastor of sorts. Whoa, did I ever feel proud? My 19 year old grandson, Evan. And, um, uh, and, and Linda and I said, you know, we need to encourage the younger people. Say, you know, I see this in you. Like Kian, for example, when he came two years ago, right now, when the pandemic started, and Ralph Eichler said to me, Henry, we need to do something because we can't meet the public. And what did you, I think you said Skype, right? Ralph, can you follow me? Or uh, said, Henry, we, we need to do something because we can't meet together. So he suggested Skype. And then, I don't know how it came out. Ken, I found out somehow it was it. Somebody suggested uh, Ken might be able to help. And, and we got this all set up. And, and just look at the, the way, it, if you go to YouTube and watch it, we get several hundred views on YouTube of this service um, every Sunday. Lyle's message on. Uh, uh, the Who Moved the Stone, that was uh, when I was away uh, a while ago. 497 views, I think it is. I, watched, I checked last night. I was 500 people. And Kian's the one who started. So, what I'm saying is that we need to encourage our young people. Yeah, so you know what? I was, I was thinking about this after Linda and I talked about it. Said, I remember when I was maybe a wolf, 12, 13 years old, somebody came to me and said, you know, Henry, I think someday you're going to be a pastor. And it, it made a tremendous impact on me. Um, I don't know why they said it. I just kind of, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a little foggy memory. And just somebody said that to me. And it, I never forgot. Now, let me say this. 
when I don't use my spiritual gift, you get cheated. Now, what if I were to say, ah, you know, I'm retired, I'm tired, I'm not going to take the church for too long. I could have said that. And I could have backed off. You would have been cheated out of the ministry because when Pastor Bernie retired, and, I don't know, maybe somebody else would come and hopefully that would have happened. And when you don't exercise your spiritual gift, I get cheated. And other people get cheated. I told the story before, but back in uh, October 1995, I was cutting a piece of board on a table saw, and instead of using a stick to push, push the board through, I thought, well, my hand will do a better job. And I uh, ended up getting into a fight with a circular saw, and I lasted only one round. And um, uh, I cut my hand right from here to here. Uh, it was a, I think it was a Monday afternoon, and we were going uh, with the associate pastor and his wife to the Winnipeg Jets hockey game that evening, and I ended up spending the evening not at the Winnipeg Arena uh, at that time, but at uh, St. Bonneville Hospital. And while there, I was in the hospital for a few days. It's interesting, I've, I've, I, I, I don't interpret this as self-pity, for sure. It's not self-pity, but I remember thinking, you know, actually, other than Linda, which she did come to see me, nobody came to visit me. And I remember thinking, you know, through the years, I've visited hundreds of thousands of people in the hospital, and uh, and I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, the gift of showing mercy is often that shows up when people go to hospitals and personal care homes and helping them shut ins and that sort of thing. That's called the gift of showing mercy. And I remember, well, I wonder if the guy, the guy who's got the gift of showing mercy, is he away this week? Or maybe he was watching that Jets hockey game or the ball game. <clears throat> you see, the body of Christ needs your ministry. My ministry. Uh, we need each other. <clears throat> I like that statement. Nobody is an island unto himself. I need your ministry and you need mine. Uh, a writer of fellows told the story how that uh, through the years his mother had been raised in poverty and they had very little money growing up. And so uh, his mom got used to working and uh, doing uh, things without modern conveniences that became available. And she kept doing them the way she had done uh, through the years uh, by hand, the hard way. And uh, he said over the years uh, we watched as she would make uh, toast. And so he said we bought her a long toaster and a second and then a third. And he said one day he was over at her place and she was making breakfast. And she went and took the bread and put it into the oven. And he said on top of the fridge was two brand new toasters that he and his siblings had given to their mom and sitting unused and she was making the toast in the oven and uh, he said when he told mom you got toasters and she said to him leave them on the refrigerator I'm used to doing the old way <laughs> and he said at the end of that some of us are like my mom we have been given wonderful gifts from God, but we don't use them. And as a result, the church does not benefit from our God-given abilities. What a waste. It is a waste. But when all of us as believers use our gifts, God works are done. Needs are met. The body of Christ is built up. And the result is spiritual growth and maturity amongst the members of the church. And that's why Paul writes, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and deceitful scheming. You know, they say that a beehive can have as many as 80,000 bees. And of course, the most important one in the beehive is uh, the queen bee, and she's the uh, most significant one. But they say there are other bees in a beehive. And uh, from people who work with bees say they call them, uh, some of them are called forager bee bees, and they're the ones who go out and collect the food. I mean, these are the ones we're most acquainted with. But apparently there are a bunch of other bees. Uh, they are uh, guard bees, and uh, these guard bees protect the uh, hive uh, and entrance from intruders. There are scout bees, uh, they say, who go out and uh, keep the hive alerted to opportunities and also to dangers. They said they are fanner bees, 
And their job as a fan or bee is to station themselves at the entrance of the hive and they fan the scent of the hive outward to signal the location of the colony to lost or disoriented bees so they can smell and say, oh, that's the direction to go. And then they say there are water collector bees. Um, they bring in moisture to regulate the humidity of the uh, hive. They said there are plasterer bees and they make cement to repair the hive. And uh, then they said there are undertaker bees and uh, their job is to remove dead bodies from the hive. And here's the statement in the article that I read. It said this, each bee has a job to do it, and it doesn't. And they said, and the delicious result is honey for you and me. And that's the way God has designed the church with you and me. He's given each of us a spiritual gift. We do our job, and the whole church benefits by it. Well, why do we use our spiritual gifts? You know, the ultimate goal is not for our own purposes. It's for the glory of God, that God may be praised. And when we use our gifts, that's exactly what happens. It's to the praise of his glory. And that's why uh, he says, <clears throat> if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. You know, when you use your gift and things happen, that's no big deal to you, but it's a big deal to God. Yeah. We humbly serve. We don't do it for recognition and, and acknowledgement and say, wow, you did a great job. We do it for the praise and the glory of God. <clears throat> Somebody put it this way, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift back to God. <laughs> you know what? If you use your gift, maybe you used your gift of music. And you know what the result is? That someone else was helped through a tough time in their life. As you sang a song, was doing worship, and the song ministered to, and that's happened to me a hundred times if it's happened once. And the songs, the words just penetrated into my heart, met the need of my life that particular moment. Or maybe where you use your gift of wisdom, and someone was redirected in their lives, and instead of destroying their life, they ended up using it in a way that fulfills it and brings glory and honor to God. Maybe you abuse your gift of giving. And then as a result of that, someone's need was met. And you became an answer to their prayers by your faithfulness to give. And maybe you used your gift of evangelism and someone came to know Jesus as Savior. And the result will be that that person will spend eternity in heaven someday with you. And they'll come to you and say, because you told me, I'm here now. Can you imagine how wonderful that would be? Have people come up to you and say, I'm here because of you. I'm in heaven because of what you said. Well, here's my question. Have you discovered your spiritual gift? Are you using it? Thank you, Lord, for giving us spiritual gifts. We know that this is all part of your great plan for our lives. We thank you that through our spiritual gifts, we can use them to glorify you and honor you and uh, do your work and that the kingdom of God may expand and grow and uh, your glory may be magnified. And I pray for this wonderful congregation of people and it's so exciting to see some of them using their spiritual gifts and it's such an encouragement to me and Linda. We're so grateful for that. But there are some perhaps here as they're growing in their spiritual experience who have not yet found their spiritual gift and have not yet been using it. Maybe they've been using it not aware that it is a spiritual gift even that information is helpful. I pray you will help us all find our spiritual gift and to use it for your glory. Or with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, take a moment and maybe start off the process by praying and saying, Lord, what is my spiritual gift? And then tell them, Lord, once you show it to me, I will use it for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Bless them to our lives. May you be honored and glorified. In Christ's name we pray.
Amen. All right, our final song by the music team, and then the benediction, and our service is over.